Good afternoon, everybody. Wow, that's a lot louder than I thought it was going to be. Yeah. My name's Amelia Weeding, and I'm here with my peer, Dave Bailey, to tell you a little bit about product security at John Deere, as well as an event I directed this past summer called the Cyber Tractor Challenge. So a uh, quick overview of what we're going to discuss. Just we're going to introduce uh, Dave and my backgrounds at John Deere, where we came from, who we are now, and uh, why we're doing what we're doing. We're going to discuss the different types of security at John Deere, uh, product security, uh, different types of uh, teams that we have, specifically our team, and uh, the different types of security processes that we use. And then for the second half of our presentation, I'll be doing a deep dive into the Cyber Tractor Challenge. So, so introduction to myself. Again, my name's Amelia Weeding. I started at John Deere a little over 11 years ago. I started off contracting in our data center. And from there, I moved to our dealership operations, where I work to help keep training dealerships running, because we have an entire stack of training or of applications that the dealerships will utilize in their day-to-day -day operations. And then outside of work, I started uh, going to cybersecurity events similar to this one. And eventually, I ended up working in cybersecurity at John Deere. It was funny, because when I started, I wondered who was doing what I'm doing now. And now I look at myself, and I'm like, oh, wait, that's me. <laughs> so uh, Dave? All right, good afternoon. Um, as Amelia said, my name is Dave Bailey. So I am a product security engineer work, uh, working uh, with our embedded devices. So I actually work with the devices that go on the vehicle. So my background is I've been with Deer just over 15 years. And I started out as a, an embedded engineer, software engineer, working on the software for, for those types of devices. And then a few years ago, I moved. Um, kind of as Melanie said, passion for security. So a few years ago, I moved into, uh, into the security area and uh, now work to help secure our products out on the vehicles. Thanks, Steve. So now a little bit about the history of John Deere. So John Deere is one of the oldest continuously operating companies on the planet, just in general. For 185 years, our company has been helping farmers do their job the way that farmers want to do their job and help them do it better and better uh, by innovating. And so uh, the company was actually founded by an innovation. So John Deere was a blacksmith, and he worked in a sawmill, so he was really exposed to a lot of tools and just building things and trying things out. And he had this problem that the farmers came to him with about the soft, sticky, uh, wet soil in the Midwest, it just was, the horses were getting tired out pulling these cast iron plows through the fields, and they couldn't work a full day with a horse like they could out east. And so the John Deere thought about it, and there was this uh, steel material that was used for saw blades in the sawmill at the time, and he decided to apply that to the self-scouring plow. And after the first four years of prototyping, he ended up with what we have here now, which became the uh, first hit of the company that you would find all over the country back around uh, 1840s. So that led to our acquisition of the company Waterloo Boy, and that's when we began to mechanize. We were able to take the technology that we had been innovating on for horse-driven implements and all of a sudden be able to get rid of the horse off the field and put a mechanical horse on the field and take advantage again of all of these new technological upgrades that were coming down the pipeline. And speaking of technology, that leads us to kind of where we ended up today. So starting back in the late 90s, we had a device that we called uh, the brown box. Uh, you can see that here. That was our first foyer into uh, precision agriculture. And throughout the years, that has become more and more complex. And through that maturation of technology, we as a company have also matured in our technological savvy in uh, many different facets. You can see the evolution of the different screens that we have here from the late 90s to our 2600 in 2005 to our 1800 in 2009 and our 2630 in 2011 and our 4640 in 2017 and then recently what was our recent one? That's all the way up. That's yep. yep, that's all the way up. So uh, you can see that our 
prowess in building hardware has grown. We actually build all of this in-house. We're not contracting with third-party companies to make these displays. We actually uh, develop our own circuit boards and everything. It's really cool. So uh, as we've matured, so has the need for security needed to mature. And that's why Dave and I are here to talk to you today. And this enables our farmers to do some amazing things, such as farm after the sun goes down. They're able to work their fields and harvest wheat even through the late evening in the dark, and their equipment knows exactly where they are because of our auto track technology. And not just speaking of displays, we have a lot of other services that are enabled by this technology. You can see here on this screen, uh, there's tractors that are running in what's called machine sync. And so they're able to know where each other are intelligently and uh, position themselves appropriately to work in tandem without the farmer having to have highly trained operators in all of the cabs. And if you didn't see at CES earlier this year, we announced uh, that we will be having the first fully autonomous tractor on the fields uh, later this fall. So keep an eye out for that. And it's not just the autonomy of the vehicles that we have been innovating on. We also have a technology that we pioneered called see and spray. So using uh, computer vision and machine learning, uh, we're able to use our highly accurate nozzles that are able to, from multiple feet above the ground, target specific plants. We can tell it exactly where to spray the herbicides so that we're not treating plants that don't need it. And this is leading to very high gains uh, of savings of that fertilizer and herbicides by the farmers. Uh, the numbers are still coming in, so I can't share any with you, but keep an eye on that. I'm sure that'll be uh, a big news when that comes out. Now this picture here is kind of what Dave and I get to feel like every day when we come to work. Uh, as Dave said, we work on the embedded systems. We work on those displays and the other uh, electronics that run on the heavy machinery that our customers rely on for their operation. But we also get to explore and find ways to make it work better for them and make it more secure. Uh, by the way, that's called FarmCraft. That's an official mod for Minecraft if you want to get it. So Dave, why don't you tell us a little about our product security? All right. Oh. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Amelia. So I'm going to talk about um, some of our other processes as, as we go through um, securing our products. As Amelia had pointed out, we've gone quite a bit through uh, innovation in our products. But as part of that, we've also had to uh, keep developing and, and increasing the security on these devices. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about is, is some of the things that we've gone through, considerations and, and things as, as we do product security. So I'm going to start this off. This is a big slide. I'm not going to read it to you. Um, but kind of you know, the big thing to, to, that we have to keep in mind, and that this is kind of at our front of our mission, is that all of this machine data, well, all of the customer data, so all of the field data, yields, planting information, all of that stuff is the customer's data, and they entrust it to us. And so that is in the forefront of our mission, is making sure that that data is kept secure, because you know, we, we need to really earn that trust. So as part of that, you know, we work through um, some very complex processes, you know, and we have quite a bit of team to to build up the security of that. So the first of that is talking about security by design. So we're making sure we're working with our engineers, both on the IT and on the machine side, to build security into the products as we're designing them. And doing that up front is, is very important to making sure that the engineers understand uh, why you know, they, need, they need these uh, these things in there and it's really making sure that we're looking at this innovation and being able to keep it sustainable because again it comes back to to that mission from our customers of securing the data okay so as part of that across our company we have um, over 300 engineers security professionals working on our security both keeping John Deere as a company safe which you know is kind of the obvious okay you work at security you know kind of job, but then stuff like Amelia and I do with keeping our products safe as well out in the field and, and being able to, to earn that customer trust. So that's kind of, like I said here, you know, you, you kind of think, okay, well, we got, you know, you work in security. Um, and then people, you know, the kind of the general mindset of 
you know, people we, we, we talked to initially are, you know, okay, you know, you, you work at the data center or you work, you know, protecting dealers or something. And yes, we have a lot of, or a lot of professionals who, who work on that. But we also have teams who are working on the product side. And product is different because while some of the technologies, you know, as you can see here, we've got an iPad in there. That's fairly standard practices and how do you secure an iPad. But there's also other devices, other embedded devices on the machine that work just a little bit differently than a normal computer that you have in, in, the, in the data center or even at your desk. We also, as we you know, are maturing our security programs, are working with the security community. So we really embrace working with the HackerOne programs, with other security researchers to be able to you know, help us become better. Also as part of that, we work with the, the Auto ISAC. So the Auto ISAC, that's the information sharing community within the automotive groups. So, you know, John Deere, as, a, as, a, as you think of, of a tractor, is very similar to a car in terms of the, 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 the controllers, the, the data flows within the, those controllers, and you know, all of that information on there. You know, a tractor is as complex as a car in terms of all of the electronics that are within there. So the automotive uh, groups, we share best practices and learn from them um, to be able to, to make sure that we're doing world-class security. And then the other thing that we're doing with the security community, um, as Amelia will talk in the second half of our uh, talk, is the Cyber Tractor Challenge. Um, and we modeled this after some other challenges that are in the industry as well. So, here, my wife told me not to read slides verbatim, but I'm going to anyway. So this is our, our product security team's mission statement. And we will defend customer value unlocked by John Deere's tech stack through simplifying secure development of our world-class products using modern and risk-based tools and processes. And we're committed to those who are linked with the LAN. And really, you know, what, what that means is you know, we're trying to make sure that the customers who are trying every day to do their best jobs in the field that we're helping them keep that data safe and make sure that they're doing their best jobs. And you know, this also says that you know, we're making sure that we're not doing our own thing because in security, the easiest way to go wrong is do your own thing. So we're learning from best practices within the industry and within the community to make sure that we're building the right products for our customers. So how do we do that? These are some of the steps that we use for, um, as part of our security by design uh, process. And so I'll go over those here in a second. Oh, sorry. But before I go into our processes, the one thing that I, you know, we keep talking about the John Deere tech stack. So what does that mean? Our tech stack, you know, as we, as we talk with our customers, are really focused on two main areas. The digital side, which is you know, the cloud-based, things like My Operations Center, JD Link, which are a little more traditional IT type uh, things. And then we have the embedded side, which is really the devices that are out on the machine. So as we start our security by design process, one of the first things that we start with is looking at um, doing threat modeling. So it's being able to look at the design, so working through with the engineers, the system architects, the systems engineers, and figuring out what is the system supposed to do, and then looking with um, the various models, such as stride or attack trees, to figure out, okay, where are things that can go wrong so that we can help get the, those mitigations, get the, the engineers and the architects thinking about that ahead of time. And as you know, we have very complex systems that sometimes then requires us to build some of our own home built tooling, which are generally aligned to, to these methods. And then as I said, you know, when we get the threat model in there, that helps us show where the, the risky parts of our system are at. So then we need to work with the teams to help them design that in secure, securely so that they're helping up front reduce the risk, reduce the vulnerability, you know, potentially, you know, depending on how what, what's shown in there, maybe you'll design out a system, so then you'll just reduce that attack surface. And one of the ways that we do that, 
is work, when we're working with the teams is using um, a process called evil user stories. So if you're familiar at all with like agile processes of doing feature development with user stories, you know, as a user, I want to get this value or I want to do X to get value out of the system. Evil user stories kind of flip that on the head and say, as an attacker, I want to do something that maybe does make the system not do what was it originally intended to do. And so it's helping the, the uh, product engineers and the product architects look at the system and say, oh, okay, so they can come in this way and we can help design that out early. If, as we talk in, you know, doing securely stuff, you know, if you're doing secure communications or, you know, just even keeping data secure within a device, you have to do things that are around cryptographic, cryptographic services. So we have teams that help them build those services into there. And then also, um, as you need to be able to identify a device as it connects back up to the cloud or connects to other computers, um, we need to be able to authenticate those devices. And so part of that requires us also to maintain our own product PKI, which is separate from our enterprise PKI. And PKI is publicly infrastructure, which is just a way of managing things like certificates and identities. So as the engineers are working through their process of designing the software, we also have some tooling that we're working with them to develop or introduce and into the system that helps them understand where are the risky parts of their system as they're writing the code. So you know, you can, we can do through threat modeling kind of figure out where the these risky parts of the, like the system interaction. So you've got one computer talking to another computer or talking to the cloud and being able to introduce or understand those types of risks. But then as you're writing the software and you're trying to implement that design, we have some tooling that we're working with them on to do things like software composition so that they know which pieces are in there because things like, you know, everybody knows about log4j and it were everywhere you had to go find it. Well, with things like SCA, you can have an idea of where that is in your system. And then things like um, static and dynamic testing tools. So to be able to sc scan the code, looking for flaws in the code early so that then we can get them fixed before they get out onto a machine. But also, you know, we get through the threat modeling, through the uh, dynamic static coding pieces, you still have to do testing at the end. You know, and if you think about, okay, well, we normally test, yes, we have a large test department that goes out and tests to make sure that machines work out in the field before we ship them to customers. But at the same rate, those people are looking for making sure that the machine's working appropriately. Our team that we work with is looking at, okay, how, do we, how can we abuse those systems a little bit to find the flaws in there, to again work them out before they get out to customers. And the reason for, for having an in-house team for some of this is that we can reproduce findings because we will work, well, we do work with, with external partners on doing some of this testing, but we need to be able to retest quickly with the teams, help them understand what the flaws are. Um, and then also through all of that, we can work deep or work with the teams and get that deep knowledge of all of the systems and be able to help, again, understand how all of the system is, is working to be able to point out back to the, to the product engineers, okay, here's maybe some risky things that you're doing or be able to understand, okay, when they want to add a new feature, what are the considerations that, that we have to do in there? So for example, this is um, a setup at my desk on how I do some testing. So I've got um, a tractor display hooked up to a power supply and then a breakout box that I can go and um, watch the can lines or inject can packets as I need to. And then this is one of our fun test tools that, that we have. And actually the engineers um, have these as well for, for their normal day-to-day -day testing. And, um, and we refer to these as hardware and loop simulators. And so this is quite literally tractor and a server rack. So it has actual controllers. So it has some of the relevant tractor controllers from a real tractor. Um, but things like GPS, you know, it's sitting inside a lab, so can't really get GPS signals in the middle of a lab. So we have to do software simulators for, for some of those pieces and some of the more dynamic pieces up there. And, you know, while it's still a tractor and a server box and it isn't free, it's still, you know, cheaper than, you know, a 9R tractor. And, and we can build more of these for our testers than we can, uh, uh, than we can actually procure or have room for. I mean, you can't just have a shed full of tractors. <laughs> Be nice, but... So Amelia, why do we hack tractors? Well, 
One of the reasons I like to hack tractors is because I get to do a lot of cool things. Uh, we get to attach to the tractors in the way that Dave was showing you on his workbench, but we also get to work with equipment like in this picture here, which I'll tell you about in a second. And we get to throw events like the Cyber Tractor Challenge. So this past summer, July 11th to the 15th, John Deere hosted an inaugural event where we brought 20 students in to learn about our hardware stack and hook up to actual equipment and be able to uh, run assessments against it. So this piece of hardware here in the picture, if you did, there's cameras or lights there, but there's nobody in the cab of that tractor. So this is uh, our autonomous tractor running in a, you know, without anybody in the cab at all. So like I said, by the end of the year, we'll actually have several farmers with uh, that technology in their hands working their fields. So a little bit about the Cyber Tractor Challenge and how we uh, advertised it to our uh, target audience. There was a lot of universities out there and we wanted to be able to partner with them. Uh, but we wanted to hone it down to the minimum viable product being an inaugural event. We wanted to make sure that we could handle the influx of uh, people who might be interested in our event. So this was one of our pieces of marketing material right here that went out to, our stu uh, to the students that ultimately ended up joining our event. But uh, we wanted them to learn new skills and network with engineers who actually built this equipment and be able to ask questions of the people who wrote the code that is still running on it to this day or maybe was written more recently. Uh, we wanted to give them hands-on equipment with hands-on access to equipment uh, because farming equipment is big and heavy, it's expensive and it's hard to bring to an event like this, but being able to bring students to an event like that like to our test farm made that possible. We also wanted to have the students see what our technology stacks look like. Because before today, I'm sure plenty of you did not know just how deep John Deere's technology stack goes, but what Dave and I work on concerns from the tires on the ground to the data in the cloud. So those were kind of the focuses where we were trying to recruit students to help us solve those challenges. We also wanted to create lasting relationships across uh, the cybersecurity industry. Uh, I'll be telling you a little bit more about some of those relationships that we created in the process of building this event. And then we also wanted to get students interested in cybersecurity because a lot of people don't realize that they know how to do cybersecurity or they're interested in cybersecurity. Quite a few times I'll be working with developers and they'll ask me, well, how do you think about getting around the blocks? I'm like, well, I used to code this stuff, so I just think about what would I do to get around my blocks. So that helps them put two and two together and start working in a more secure manner. And that comes back to those evil user stories. They'll even uh, write tests for those. But uh, we wanted to bring the students in and, and help them grow their skill sets. So how did we build this capability? How did we build this out? Because it was quite a monumental task to build a brand new program at a 185-year-old company, right? Um, but we had the support that we needed to do so. So it really all started with me entering the cybersecurity realm at John Deere a couple of years ago. They asked me, hey, Amelia, what do you want to do? And I said, huh, I want to hack a tractor. I want to bring a tractor to a hacking event. But what better way to do that than to show you a short video? And I don't know why that's not playing in this mode, but let me see if I can get it up here. Where did the video go? The video disappeared. That's super weird. Hold on one sec. Yeah, there was supposed to be a video right here. Let me, did we accidentally delete a slide? Well, I'm just gonna hit Command Z until it, there it is, cool. All right, so let's play from current slide. Cool. Oh, I don't have any sound out of the computer. Oh, it was never hooked up. We have a plug. I don't know that this has a plug for the, oh yeah, it's over here, cool. Sorry about that. Yeah, technology, imagine that. So 
So this, uh, while we get this set up, I'll just tell you a little bit about how I uh, built the event. It was really me telling the right people in the right meetings that I wanted to do something crazy. So is that going to be good? We'll see. OK. Let's see. Play? what do you want to do at John Deere? And I said, I want to take a tractor to a hacker arena. I want to bring in uh, white hat hackers, uh, students that want to learn, anybody that wants to learn about our equipment, and uh, Give us a feel of kind of the auto hacking village at DEF CON or other cybersecurity events. We modeled our event after the Cyber Auto Challenge and the Cyber Truck Challenge. Uh, we had some great conversations with some benchmarking partners in those industries who had uh, really helped us to understand the value that comes from these types of uh, events in terms of learning about opportunities in your products, whether those are vulnerabilities or bugs, uh, but also uh, really great uh, to hear and we learned that so, uh, they need to attract some of the top talent in the world, and that's exactly what we see today. Uh, we have a, a room full of 20 uh, bright engineers that are aspiring, uh, embedded software engineers as well as uh, security hackers. So what interests me um, with John Deere is the fact that you guys are not just, you know, building tractors just to, you know, assist farmers to plow lands or just like that. You guys are focused on sustainability and you guys, you know, are heading in the right direction in terms of um, sustainability and, you know, technology. You know, you guys are uh, way ahead of the, the game pretty much. I would love to find a bug and <laughs> solve it. Um, I, I love figuring out how to make a system do something it's not supposed to do or something that we didn't think it could do. So I would love to be able to find something like that while I'm here. <laughs> I have some background, like work experience in the ag tech industry. So I think it's just relevant to what I already know. And it'd just be fun. I think hacking tractors, that's fun. I think first I want the students to see just how awesome a place John Deere is to work and they are doing that, right? They're interacting with a ton of amazing engineers both in cybersecurity as well as our engineering community. Secondarily, I think uh, the students are learning and seeing that John Deere is, because we're a top brand, because we're elevating as a tech company, a target. Throughout the years as we've developed more and more intricate technology, that are, you know, the electrification of it and everything, the stacks have built on top of each other. And those stacks are what our customers rely on today, globally. Over 300,000 devices deployed in the field being used to feed the world. There's a real need for people that have the talents that they have to come and help us find where there might be uh, some holes or opportunities in our products so that we can button those up, continue to be that uh, premier ag equipment and technology producer, and keep our customers safe in the field. So that was a bit of media that was produced for us uh, by our public relations department uh, through a coordination with them. And that was one of the partnerships I had to develop along, my, uh, along the way. So, so yeah, it started with me saying, I want to take a tractor to a hacker arena. And then them saying, well, why don't you make your own hacker arena? We're John Deere. We can do that. So I wrote an outline for the event. And we modeled it after a event called Cyber Truck Challenge and also Cyber Auto Challenge. Uh, those are similar sister events to ours. And by modeling after them, we were able to ensure that our first year was a, a roaring success. So it also was a lot of scheduling meetings, a lot of people to talk to. So in a, as old of a company and as big of a company as ours, there's going to be a lot of people who are interested in when, what we're doing and when we're doing things like this. So being able to align across all of those different realms was very important because we want to make sure that we're all working together to achieve uh, the right goals. And we had to get buy-in from the right people as well. 
because once we found the right people to talk to, we had to convince them that we wanted to create our own hacking event for students to learn about and assess our equipment. And uh, once we were able to do that, we were able to start really setting target milestones. Uh, when did we want to get stuff done? Figuring out where we're going to host it, things like that. Uh, we used GitHub issues and GitHub projects to be able to keep track of the work that was there to be done. Uh, we also had to define what resources we needed. To be able to build an event like this, we want to be able to provide all the resources to the students that they would need to be successful. So how do you do that? How do you get 30 laptops? How do you get 30 USB uh, sticks or Wi-Fi wi cards? Right? And we needed to figure out what help we needed because I wasn't going to do this alone. This isn't my full-time job working the cyber track, running the Cyber Tractor Challenge. It was just something that I started building and it just got bigger and bigger and bigger until for about two weeks it was my full-time job. Um, the backlog was, was fun to organize. Uh, but once we recruited internally and found the resources that we need to coordinate the event, which I'll talk about those coordinators in the next slide, it made things go a lot more smoothly and uh, it was easier to assign work and of uh, ultimately I was able to direct a team to build and run that event. So what kind of coordinators did I need? And, uh, what were they doing? So one of the most important things to me was the syllabus for the material that we were going to teach. And to figure out what that material was, we had to look at our threat modeling, as Dave was talking about, and what kind of attack vectors are out there today. I'll be sharing a couple of those challenges here shortly. But um, working with our classroom coordinator, we were able to come up with a syllabus. And working with the folks at Cybertruck Challenge, we were able to get introduced to several different organizations that uh, came in to teach some of our classes. And then there's another term up here, so it might be familiar, might not be, called cyber range. It's what the US military and private security firms will use to uh, refer to their computer room where the computers might not survive, where they're meant to be attacked. It's where you have your test equipment set up. So we had to make sure that we conserved our resources appropriately and get the right equipment for our students and uh, not only procure it, but we had to make sure we distributed it appropriately, had all the power adapters, all the cables, because uh, we did bring 20 students in. And that's a lot of equipment. We made sure that we had at least a display for every single student uh, that was appropriate for the type of work that we were uh, challenging them to do. Another big one that was brand new for me was hospitality, figuring out how to house 20 students when you're doing an all expenses paid event. How do you get flights booked for 20 people? How do you get hotels booked for 20 people? How do you handle people asking if they can drive and figuring out the, the logistics of that? So I got to learn quite a bit about areas of the company I had never been exposed to because I've mainly been in the technology areas of the company. And then we needed a separate IT, IT coordinator because we didn't want our students operating on a public network. We didn't want them operating on our internal networks. We wanted to make sure to give them the appropriate walled garden to operate in to prevent any kind of impact to our production environments. Because the last thing we want to do is throw an event and have farmers all of a sudden calling us saying the tractors aren't working. So our IT coordinator was able to ensure we had a secure network network as well as uh, procure 30 laptops on their way to recycling. So we were able to prevent 30 pieces of equipment from going on to their next stage of life, which we have no idea where that would have been. Uh, but we now have them to use for coming years. And uh, as with any company, we have legal. So I had somebody that was working with us from legal that knew uh, how to write the documents. She was learning along the way with some of the things uh, as, as we were explaining cybersecurity to lawyers. But it was, it was really an eye opener to see how much they want to help us do what we're doing. And of course, photography is a big deal. We do have some pictures that uh, we have taken and we're working on getting more than just that media that was produced, released right now. But having those uh, photographers there to document the event, because this was a, a, an historical event for our company. It was something that we had never done uh, before. And uh, we needed to have somebody to help push me along. So I had a project manager and several of my managers that I would meet with regularly that would just go through the schedule with me and, and you know, Amelia, why do you want to do this? Because I want to have students, you know, have fun learning about hacking our tractors and learning about our technology stack and help recruit them into this culture. And, and so they would help, uh, help me get along. 
and we also had to have somebody from public relations help us so that we could be here today to talk to you because if we hadn't established that relationship we wouldn't have been able to get the right buy-in from the right people to be here so uh, that also was a really fun relationship to build out and then recruiting our recruiting manager knocked it out of the park we were able to uh, hone it down to six schools that we targeted and we accepted applications from uh, I think 11 different schools so even though we only advertised at six we had 58 applications and we we weren't just limiting it to those specific schools we were just that's where we originally advertised uh, and then of course safety manager we did uh, do this on a working test farm so there was equipment running outside all day. We had to have the doors closed because, you know, there's equipment running test firmware, running around, uh, being validated for our customers. And our students were inside with two other tractors, a 5R and an 8R, that they were able to just hook up to anytime during assessment days and test any ideas that they had had from their classes or maybe experience they had brought with them. But we wanted to make sure they were doing that securely. So they had to go through safety training. We provided them with the right safety materials, metatarsal boots when they're around the big tractors because we don't want anybody getting hurt. And we had a site manager to set everything up and make sure we had the right tables, make sure we had the right power uh, and all of uh, that. And make sure the person who was running the site knew we were going to be there, scheduling, hey, this is the time we're going to be there, July 11th to the 15th. And um, yeah, she was, she was a champ. She, at the end of the event, she said, I'm surprised security didn't call me once during your event. <laughs> it was pretty great. And then we had swag, of course, uh, giving everybody a John Deere hat that came to our events, along with uh, some notebooks, a bag, and other things that might be useful to them. And we'll talk about one of those items in a sec. So, so what were our goals? Why did we do this? I'm going to take a drink of water. Hold on. That was a bad idea. So we wanted to grow our relationship with the wider cybersecurity community. Right now, there is a national shortage of cybersecurity professionals like me and Dave and other people here at this event. And we want to grow the relationships. We already have relationships in the security industry, but it's a new world. And as our technology matures, we need to mature as a company and grow those relationships. So, we also want to create public awareness of our tech stack because the more people we talk to and ask, what do you think of John Deere? They think farming. And we want them to think technology. Like, yeah, farming. Of course we're going to be a farming company. We've been a farming company for 185 years, but we're also a technology company, helping our customers do their jobs better with the technology we provide to them. And we also want to bolster the security of our fleet. We want to take what's already running in the field, connected to our back end, and make sure it's running in the most secure way possible so that the customers can continue to operate day to day. Because that's the most important thing to us, is that our customers are able to do their jobs safely and securely day to day. But how do we do that? Well. We create an event that can continue to grow through the years where we can talk about it, where we can actually reach out to the security community like everybody here. Because when I joined the cybersecurity community at John Deere, I was told, Amelia, we don't find people like you. You find us. And so we're here today because we want to put ourselves in those arenas where people like us can find us and realize what they can do to, to help us in our mission to those who are linked with the land. And that comes down to recruiting into the cybersecurity uh, culture. It, it really doesn't matter if you're going into John Deere cybersecurity or any other industry's cybersecurity. It's across the field that we need all of these experts. So. If we're able to host this event and inspire several students to go into the field of cybersecurity, we're helping close that gap for others and for ourselves. So what did we teach? I'm sure you're pretty uh, curious about that. I'm sure that's quite on your mind. Uh, we had an intro to hardware assessments where we used a Pi Pico and we had a team of industry professionals. Uh, Grimm came and presented for us. They came up with some class materials around the Pi Pico. I'll show you some pictures of those in a minute. 
and uh, was very well uh, received by the students, and they all had a lot of fun with their Pi Picos. We also had Intro to CAN Bus J1939. So as Dave t said earlier, we have a lot of devices running on our equipment, and one of the technologies they use to communicate with the displays and other equipment on board is CAN Bus. And CAN spell, uh, stands for Common Area Network, and it just operates on a voltage differential between two lines for uh, sending data across. Uh, J1939 is just our specific flavor that we have uh, for uh, that protocol. But uh, that content came from Cyber Truck Challenge as well as brand new uh, content that was developed by Dr. Jeremy Daly at the Colorado State University. We also had an advanced CAN bus, ISO bus course because ISO bus is another protocol that is used on our equipment. And we also had an introduction to radio frequency and wireless assessments. Our equipment has a lot of different wireless stacks on board, from Wi-Fi to Bluetooth to GPS to LTE. Uh, there's a lot of different radio antennas on there. So we wanted to give the students tools that they needed to assess that if that's the targets they wanted to go for. And speaking of targets, I wonder, oh, what were those targets? Probably want to know, right? So. So some of those targets, um, we wanted to check out, have the students look at our update stack, because that's a popular one in the common industry standards to look at. We wanted to look at the CAN bus. What can you do on our CAN bus just by plugging in physically to this one specific piece of machinery? Can you get a uh, pivot to any parts of the tractor from there? Data protection. Uh, as Dave was saying, we give the farmers the tools to collect the data and to analyze the data and to do with their data what they want. But to, be able to do that, we have to protect it so that they can rely on John Deere for the integrity of their data. So one of the things is, can you exfiltrate data you shouldn't have from the tractor? But the most important one to us this year was, can you make the tractor do something it, it shouldn't wirelessly? Can you make a remote control tractor without connecting to it physically? Because we want to make sure that our fleet is secured from attacks that would impact more than one unit, right? Because we have a fleet of over 300,000 units in the field, and we want to make sure that people can't just wirelessly, over one of the technologies on board of our equipment, cause harm to our customers' operations. So how did the event go? As you saw in the, pic the video, it went really well. It, it actually went off without a hitch. We had some fun moments that I wish I could tell you about up here on the stage, but unfortunately I can't. You know how cybersecurity events can be. But uh, we had a lot, of, a lot of camaraderie built between the students. Most of the students had never met each other before. As I said, we brought students in from multiple universities uh, around the country, including working with HBCUs, to bring in the diversity that we were looking for. So of course you're going to have a lot of brand new friendships that we're forming, that even to this day I have students reaching out to me, thanking me for introducing them. And the students were ridiculously engaged. They were all over our equipment, asking us every single question under the sun. And, Dave and I have our work cut out for us next year. <laughs> yeah. Um, and on the assessment days, we had to force the students to go home. So we gave the students from 8 a.m. until 8.30 p.m. for two straight days to, to assess our equipment with the expertise of the teachers who had taught the classes they had just taken to guide them. And at 8.30 every night, without fail, they would, they would, give, me, they would give me groaning when I would try to get them on the bus. So I think next year we're going to try to go a little later. Yeah. Uh, but we did have excellent student presentations. I wish I could tell you about them. Uh, we had uh, multiple groups of students that uh, formed together and, and came up with some great content that gave us some more things to throw into our threat modeling. So, so a little bit about the Pi Pico that was used by the students. Um, why did we use that? It's a $4 microprocessor, right? Surely there's got to be better microprocessors out there. Have you tried to get a Raspberry Pi recently? Have you seen the obscene prices and you can only buy one at a time? So we looked around for what was available and we found that the Pi Pico was perfect. It was a $4 microprocessor. It's easy to train with. You can code right on the device with MicroPython or CircuitPython. Or if you want to code directly to the RP2040 on board, you can. Uh, they're available. We were able to order them in quantity, uh, and it was really easy to get them in. It was really cool. I've never gotten pre-made boards on a roll before. That was really interesting. 
but uh, the students were each sent home with a Pi Pico. So I actually designed an open SCAD, the case you see there around the Pico, so that you could see down inside of it uh, all the numbers, and then on the back you can get to the reset button. So we actually 3D printed those in-house using 3D printers back at our Intelligent Solutions group. Um, and I want to show you what one of the students decided to do with their Pi, Pi Pico during the event. So even when they weren't focused on hacking on the tractors, one of the students was decided she wanted to keep hacking. So this is one of the things that she did. So what the Pi Pico can do is it can emulate an HID device like a keyboard, and it can also <laughs> push files to devices, so you could just have the keyboard pop up and push a file. So what she did was she wrote a script that would uh, just install a desktop on a Linux computer when she plugged it into it, and if another student left their laptop unlocked, she would just walk up to it and change the background to another student wearing a, a John Deere hat, as you saw there. So I kind of already told you who was there, so I can tell you. Um, who was there? So Grimm, they taught our reverse engineering course on the Pi Pico that I just showed you. They wrote their own payload for it and were able to teach to it. They used a MicroPython payload that ended up going home with the students because I wanted to make sure the students had the tools when they went home to continue their research. Because I don't know how many cybersecurity trainings you've been to where you learn on a software, you learn on a tool that you get home and you're like, oh, that's going to cost me a lot of money to get. Well, we wanted to make sure that they never even had that thought of, oh, it's going to be impossible to get, right? Um, AIS, they taught our wireless course and were able to teach the students on a couple of Raspberry Pi devices that they brought and some uh, Wi-Fi antennas that we provided for them to be able to practice intercepting Wi-Fi communications, PCAP files, uh, running different kind of uh, password cracking utilities, stuff like that. Uh, and as I said, Colorado State University, uh, Dr. Jeremy Daly taught our CAN bus J1939 course. He is very, very experienced in this field. So if you have any questions about it, feel free to reach out to him. He'll be happy to help. You can just Google him. He pops right up. And then our own Dave Smart taught our advanced CAN bus and ISO bus. He actually wrote some of those protocols. During the event, he was available for all of the students. Uh, while he is retired, he does continue to contract with us because he just couldn't stay away, right? This stuff's too much fun. And he had never actually done any kind of hacking work before, so it was, it was really fun corrupting him and introducing this, him to this. But uh, he actually, at one point, had a line for students long asking questions about the protocols because he's like, oh, yeah, I wrote that. I, I can tell you how that works. And then we also worked with Carl Heimer with the Cybertruck and Cyber Auto Challenges. And those are similar in industry events to ours where they focus in one on the semi-truck industry and on the other, the automotive industry. So if you're interested in those, uh, research those uh, events. And they also are similar to ours in that uh, they're student sponsorships. They're different in how they're done, so they're not all uh, paid like ours are, uh, not both of them. But yeah, you can look that up. So post-event follow-up, what are we doing next, right? How do I get invited to this? I'll tell you that in a sec, how you can apply. Uh, we got retro activities ongoing right now. We're meeting, uh, we were meeting weekly, and now we're meeting uh, monthly our coordinator team where each of us is developing out what our roles are going to be for the following year and planning for the 2023 Cyber Tractor Challenge, which we do have our dates now. It will be June 26th through the 30th. Um, and we're developing our recruiting materials, so. Welcome to one of those, yeah, right? Um, and I also want to get myself a tractor to break, right? Because a girl's got to have dreams. And one of the things that uh, kind of held me back this year, uh, whether or not we bring our hill there next year or we're able to get a tractor that is able to be taken out of commission for longer, I want to be able to allow the students and myself to not be scared of uh, breaking this equipment because we all think it's easy to press enter until you've written the script and you get to the point where you're going to press enter against a half a million dollar piece of machinery. So a girl's got to have dreams, right? <laughs> so how do you learn more about the 2023 Cyber Tractor Challenge? Well, I made a handy dandy QR code here for you. It's the, the, pi, the QR code library in Python's great. Um, but if you scan that QR code here, it'll be in the slideshow that we release afterwards. Uh, you can get on a mailing list where once the applications are open for the 2023 Cyber Tractor Challenge, we'll, we'll send a, a blast out to all of those email addresses. So 
To be able to get into the event, uh, you would have to apply and be a student full-time in a four-year or two-year accredited university and be interested in the field of cybersecurity, embedded engineering, programming. Maybe you're an artist and you've never heard of this cybersecurity or computers before and you want to learn. We want to see your resume. We want to see what you got, what you've made, because you never know what they've done with electronics. I can't tell you how many of our students actually said, no, I have no embedded experience on their forms. And as we're reviewing their applications, we're like, wow, they really do have a lot of embedded experience. But people don't seem to know the difference. So. Feel free to email us at cybertractorchallenge at johndeere.com if you have questions. Sign up for our mailing list. And if you're looking for a job, as I said, well, there's a shortage in the cybersecurity community right now, right? We have over 300 people working on cybersecurity within John Deere, but we need more. So check out uh, deere.com slash careers and go search for cybersecurity careers. It doesn't have to be cybersecurity. It can be IT. It can be anything else that you might be interested in. We have positions posted all over the board. So with that, I think that's our presentation. Yeah.